Hi everyone, welcome to Front and Center as we continue our look at the fundamental technologies underlying web performance. This time, we're looking at caching and how certain HTTP headers can control the behavior of a CDN for maximum performance. This episode was made available thanks to the support of Lookahead. We'll be continuing to use Pithy as an example. If you haven't seen the last episode, Pithy is a project of mine that I'll be developing over the course of many episodes. It'll eventually become a place to save clever quotes or bits of writing that you come across, but at the moment, it's a purely static mock-up. In the last episode, we looked at how latency affects performance on a fundamental level because of the way TCP itself works, and ended by demonstrating the impact that a CDN like Cloudflare can have. But we left a lot out, in particular how you actually configure a setup like this. That's what we'll be talking about today, and it demonstrates another part of the web that works so well that most of the time you barely notice it, caching. Caching on the web as we know it today was introduced to the HTTP specification in version 1.1, released in 97. It coincided with the initial explosion of both the popularity of the web and the capabilities of web browsers, and is largely untouched today. The key contribution of HTTP 1.1 was the cache control header, and it's worth understanding just what it changed. It's important to understand that caching really only applies to what's known as the safe HTTP methods, of which get is by far the most common. Submitting a form or requesting that an object gets deleted aren't the sort of thing that can be cached because they have some consequence on the server. Luckily for us, our site so far is totally static, and so we only need to worry about the GET requests, but in the future we'll look at performance considerations of destructive actions as well. Prior to 1.1, there are basically two types of GET requests. If you had a previous copy of a resource, you could send the if modified since header to tell the server that if the file hasn't changed since your copy was downloaded, to respond with a 304 instead of sending the full data. If that header wasn't present, you'd always get the full response. That mechanism is still in place, but cache control added a new, even faster behavior. When you first receive the object, the cache control header declares how long it's valid for. And so if you next request that object within that time frame, your web browser doesn't even have to make a request at all. There's a complex interplay of headers and directives that govern this behavior. And while I'll briefly mention all of these today, my goal today is not to define each one in the abstract. Rather, by the end of today's episode, I hope you'll understand why I'm choosing to host Pithy AF in a certain way. That'll change over time as we add more functionality to the app, but right now it's a purely static site, and the caching strategy for that is really transferable to the static portions of even highly dynamic apps. To simplify things, I'm going to avoid using the HTTP terminology because it can be a bit unintuitive. For our purposes, there's really only the three possibilities for each GET request that your browser needs to make. The first is cache missing, when the browser simply does not have a copy of the object in question. New users will start their visit in this mode, at least for the content that's specific to your site. Conditional gets equate to stale, where the browser has a copy but it's expired or otherwise needs revalidation. Finally, a valid cache means the browser doesn't have to make a request. You can think of these as different modes that the browser can be in for a particular resource, and I'll be using the terms missing, stale, and valid throughout the episode in this manner. Today we'll look at how cache headers determine which state a browser is in. Let's see what we're starting with. I'm running a copy of Pithy on a local development server, and if we refresh a few times, we see that every request is returning a 200, a full, fresh copy of each resource every time. That's because our server is sending down the no store cache control header, which tells the browser to really truly never cache what we just sent. It means every subsequent request is going to be in the cache missing state because our browser is refusing to keep a copy around for next time. I'm serving these files using the simplest possible Node Express server I could come up with, where I'm simply setting the header of all the files so we can see the effect. To switch our browser from missing to stale, we can change the cache control directive to no cache. This is one of the many instances where the terms seem counterintuitive. No cache means you can store a copy, but you can't use it unless you check with the server. If we refresh now, we see that each resource is being returned with a 304. This is the server telling us that our stale object is up to date and so there's no point sending it again. That's possible because when we sent the request, we also sent two headers with the timestamp and a fingerprint of the copy in our cache. Since that matches the last modified and e tag of the resource from the server's point of view, we can verify that nothing's changed. This behavior is actually really nice. Since we don't need to download anything we already have, we can always serve a 304 in a single round trip. And yet, since we're checking with the server each time, we never accidentally use an asset that's out of date. One of my favorite static site hosts, Surge, uses this caching strategy exclusively. It tells the browser that the objects are valid for an entire year, but then ensures that the browser will always check that they have the latest version. It's not a bad approach. It's guaranteed to never serve a stale asset, and it's about as good as you can do if you have no knowledge of the files themselves. 
but with a little bit of tooling and a CDN, you can do a lot better. The problem with putting your browser into stale mode is that the relationships between the assets aren't cached. The fact that main CSS references background JPEG doesn't mean that the browser will ask for them both at once. Once it finds out that its copy of main CSS is up to date, it'll parse it, find the reference to background, and incur another round trip. So in practice, while you might have a cache of every asset on the page, the repeated round trips can make the site feel just as slow. To really speed things up, we need the browser to know that the copies it already has are current, and to not even check with the server. To do that, we'll use the max age header, which is the time in seconds that an asset can be used before checking in with the server. If we set our cache control header to max age 10, we should be able to observe the browser dropping out of valid mode and entering stale. On the first refresh, nothing has changed, since it'll still be using the no cache directive from before. But on the second refresh, we see that the three assets are all being served from the memory cache, but the index.html isn't. This isn't a problem with our caching headers, it's actually because refreshing the browser puts it into stale mode, at least for the HTML file. Popping open a new tab, then opening DevTools before hitting the URL is the only way I've found to really check that the caching headers are working. Now we can see that we've loaded the whole page without a single network request, which is really as fast as we can possibly get. Technically, it also works offline, though as soon as someone tries to refresh a page or our max age times out, it'll break. We'll make Pithy work properly offline in the future, but we won't consider it further for now. We set our max age to only 10 seconds, which means if we refresh now, we see that we've already dropped back from valid to stale, sent requests back to the server and received three or fours in response. Let's increase max age then and see what happens. It's specified in seconds, so this sets the max age to one day. Refreshing a couple of times, we can see that the new headers are now stored. This means that for the next 24 hours, the browser won't bother checking with the server whether it's changed, and it brings us to the great trade-off when it comes to caching. How do you balance wanting your site to load as fast as possible with the need to be able to propagate updates? If we wanted to make a change to the site, let's say changing the background color of this first quote, we have no way of telling the browser that there's been an update. We can refresh all we want, but Chrome won't think to check if style CSS has been updated until the cache expires 24 hours from now. If you, say, shipped some broken CSS to production, users could still be getting a broken site a full day after you fix it. Now, you probably already know instinctively that to fix it you hold shift when refreshing, which ignores the locally cached version and goes back to the server for the full data. But very few of your customers are going to know that shortcut, and even fewer will try it if your site is broken. Most will simply leave and never return. That's specific to using Chrome, by the way. Other browsers will revalidate all the resources when you reload, but that may be changing. Other browsers will revalidate just the HTML if you do what's called a same page navigation, clicking the address bar and then hitting enter. Recently, there's been discussions about whether reloads should be considered the same as a same page navigation. Only revalidating one resource is much faster, particularly on mobile networks. The point being that you can't rely on a user being able to reload to get the new version of whatever asset is broken. To summarize, a shift or hard reload is effectively putting your browser back into cache missing mode. And a same page navigation or reload will drop either the HTML file or all the assets into stale mode depending on the browser. Back to our original problem though. What does this mean for setting max age on your responses? How can you get the benefit of a long lived cache without incurring the risk of not being able to replace broken code? GitHub Pages takes the short max age approach, setting it to 10 minutes. Similar to Surge, this is a reasonable strategy when you don't know anything about the files themselves, but it's a long way from the best case scenario. The root cause of these problems is because we're expecting that the content of a file can change independently of its URL. If we knew that a given file would never change, we could set the max age to a huge number and breathe easy. Then when we need to update it, we could just point everything at a new URL. Obviously, manually coming up with a new file name each time isn't a reliable approach, so instead we can generate one based on the contents of that file. This is called content addressable storage, and it's hugely effective. You treat assets in production as immutable, tell the browsers to cache them forever, and then task your build system with keeping the URLs up to date. It's an idea that I've been able to trace back to 2006 with a blog post by Cal Henderson, then at Flickr. It used PHP to write the file names dynamically based on the release version, a technique that was later called revision stamping or revving. It then popped up in Steve Souder's book High Performance Websites as a core part of Ruby on Rails in version 3.1, later in JavaScript as a Gulp plugin, and then as a key piece of what makes Webpack so useful. These days, most modern front-end build pipelines will support this technique, but you still need to make sure that you're setting your cache headers to take advantage of it. 
I have a gulp file here that's doing just that. First, it loads up any CSS, JavaScript, and SVG files, then uses the gulp rev plugin to calculate a file name based on the content. It saves the renamed files in the disk directory, then outputs a manifest, a mapping from the original source files to their new names. After all the assets are revved, we read in the manifest and replace any references to the files in our index.html, before writing it to the disk directory as well. I quite like how straightforward this kind of process is with Gulp, compared to something like Webpack. And even though Webpack is a far more comprehensive build pipeline, and we will eventually switch Pithy to use it, it doesn't hurt to know a couple of different ways to accomplish the same task. If we run this, we should see some new files being generated. Our disk directory now has our index.html as well as the revision stamped asset files, and the index.html is pointing correctly at them. Now if we set long lived cache headers, we should see the behavior we're after. We can do that pretty easily by checking if the file name contains a revision hash. This regex will match if the file name contains seven or more hexadecimal characters in a row, which is a reasonable way of detecting that a file has been revved. If we were worried this might match some files incorrectly, we could have read in the manifest file that our gulp pipeline produced, but this is fine for now. Now we just need to set the max age to something huge, like a year, but only if the file has been revision stamped. This way our index.html is not caught up in the same caching rules and we can push changes easily. If we refresh the page, we see that the URLs have been updated and the cache control header now has our long max age. Those assets are now treated as immutable and so will continue to be served from the cache for as long as there's room on the disk for those files. Now when we make a change to the CSS file and rerun gulp, we should be generating a file of a different file name and therefore completely bypassing the cache for the previous CSS. Yep, that's exactly what we see. The other two files are being served from the cache, but the new URL has never been seen before, so it comes through as a 200. So that's all fairly straightforward, and I'd hazard a guess that most front-end developers are generating revision stamped assets these days. But how does this relate to using a CDN, and how does latency figure in? Well, a CDN is effectively a distributed cache. Each node in a CDN's network operates much like the browser cache of one of your customers. It's just shared between everyone in a geographic location. The beauty of the HTTP headers we've been looking at is that they work just as well for intermediate servers as they do for end users, although there are some that are specific to one or the other. But basically, any asset that would have been cached by the browser will also be cached by the CDN. I've deployed this code on Heroku and put Cloudflare in front of it, and we should be able to see the CDN at work. If we refresh, we see that our three objects are cached in the browser, but if we hard refresh, effectively simulating a user's first visit, we can see that the three assets are coming down with a latency of around 30 milliseconds. Looking at the headers, we can see that our cache control is telling the CDN to cache this asset for a year, and so we're being served from the local copy at the Sydney data center. The index HTML isn't being cached, and so it's coming directly from Heroku. That's in the east coast of the US, and from Melbourne, I'm seeing a latency of four to 500 milliseconds. Now we don't want the browser to cache this file. We want it to be stale, and so that each request will check with the server to see if anything's changed but it would be better to have to check with the server 30 milliseconds away, not 500. There's two things we need to do to make this happen. The first is that we have to tell Cloudflare to respect cache headers on HTML files. By default, it only caches things it considers static, like images, CSS, and JavaScript. We do that by adding a page rule to say cache everything on all URLs. Here, I'm using a wildcard for the subdomain as well, so this will work for all future versions of Pithy that I publish. Now, if we refresh, we should see an important header coming through for the index.html. CF cache status miss. This means that Cloudflare is trying to cache the HTML, but because the max age is zero, it can't. Of course, if we set max age to something else, like an hour or a day, both the CDN and the browser would cache it, but thankfully there's a special header to target intermediate caches only. It's called S max age, and it works exactly like max age, but for intermediate caches like CDNs. This rule will tell the browser to treat this response as stale, but the CDN to treat this response as valid for a year. The important difference is that we have a way to tell the CDN that this file has changed, which we'll look at in a second. I've also added the immutable header to those assets that are revision stamped. This is a newly proposed directive that explicitly targets page reloads. For browsers that would have normally invalidated all assets when you reload, immutable tells them not to bother. It's currently released in Firefox and has been committed to Chrome but not released yet, but it won't break anything in other browsers, so it's something you can add right now. But back to publishing updates. The final piece of working with a CDN is understanding invalidation and purging. Thankfully, we don't need to rely solely on HTTP headers to control what the CDN thinks is current. We can click a button to purge everything. 
This is a pretty blunt approach, but it's a good escape hatch. A much better way is to only invalidate the HTML file and do that during deployment. I'm using a package called Cloudflare CLI that wraps the API and it's working quite well. I'm evoking it during deployment, directly after pushing to Heroku. This code is online on GitHub, and I'll be publishing each stage of the pithy build in this manner, so that whenever you're watching these episodes, you'll be able to drill into the code that I'm presenting. Okay, to summarize, what we've built is really the fastest possible static site without having to cache the HTML file. Deploys are still virtually instantaneous, assets are downloaded from a server with the lowest possible latency and then cached forever, and no requests ever have to travel all the way back to the origin, even if the user does a hard reload to bypass their own cache. As we build out the project, the number and size of our assets will only grow, but this architecture can basically lie undisturbed for the life of the project. I really encourage you to drill down into this stuff and try to get your own projects hosted as fast as possible. This kind of tuning is usually overkill for the site in question, but it gives you an invaluable understanding of the mechanics of web performance. And with that, we've come to the end for today, and the end of our look at the foundations of web performance. Before you go, I'd like to thank Lookahead again for making this episode available. They hire software engineers and CTOs in Australia and are big supporters of the local development community. They're a small team, I've known them all for years, and I can't recommend them highly enough. Front and Center is a subscription screencast series, and it's through the support of companies like Look Ahead that we're able to make these episodes available on YouTube for free. For access to the full catalog, head on over to frontend.center and subscribe. There are new episodes being released every month. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Front End Center.